about the 1st of October, 1849. Seven months after leaving home, we passed through the Golden Gate and stepped ashore upon the Promised Land. This, like all other places in California at that time, including San Francisco, was a chaos of board cabins and tents. There was not as yet any defined and recognized ownership of land, nor any laws for the protection of life and property, but the universal instinct of self-preservation and the omnipotent power of public opinion guaranteed to both life and property complete security in one of the greatest communities and des of desperados and criminals ever congregated on the face of the earth. A journal published by Fremont had given me a good knowledge of the whole country, so that I felt no apprehensive, no apprehension of getting lost, and the topographical features as to rivers, plains, and mountains were so uniformly, as he described them, that we made no mistake in our calculations of courses and distances. <clears throat> About sixty miles of level country intervened, before we could reach the foothills of the Sierra Nevada in the gold belt, where our winter quarters were to be located. This tract of country had now become flooded, and the soil was a soft paste in which our wagon wheels would often sink to the hub. Often the mules were mired, and, becoming discouraged, one after another would lie down. On such occasions we unloaded the wagon, taking the goods ahead to some comparatively hard ground, comparatively, comparatively hard ground, and then by main strength hauled out the animals one by one, pushed or lifted the empty wagon forward, reharnessed and reloaded, only to repeat the same experience over and over again. Thus our progress was slow, one day only three miles, but at length we reached the foothills, and where the soil was hard, and then we had no more trouble in moving along. Having indicated where the party were to locate, I left them in charge of our second officer in an open grove, where they at once began to build a spacious log cabin, near a ravine where other gold hunters had already begun work. After three months' experience in gold washing in our associated capacity, the more intelligent and conscientious of our company reached the conclusion that it was inadvisable to continue the organization, a conclusion I had already reluctantly accepted. By our contract we were pledged to two years' service. The sick were to be cared for by a good doctor, who was one of our members and for whose use we had a full supply of medicines and surgical tools. The departments of labor were assigned to and regulated by an executive committee. Profits and benefits were to be equally shared, and as there was no civil administration of law, any needed discipline was to be enforced by a majority vote. Our members were superior to the average in intelligence and morals, and in mental and physical capacity, but it was soon demonstrated that a few would contribute a much larger share than others to the common product, that many would shirk duty, and that some, in the assurance that they would be provided for, were downright drones. Hundreds of companies, representing nearly every state of the Union, had been organized on a similar plan, and all had had the same experience. Most of them disbanded as soon as they reached California, and all did so after a short period. I returned to San Francisco and sold off the effects of the company. The goods which we had shipped from New York were in great demand when they arrived. A cooking range and fixtures, which had cost $60, sold for 400 A farm wagon and harness, which had cost $90, brought $500. A lot of cheeses sealed hermetically in tin, for which we had paid 16 cents a pound, sold for from 125 to 150 per pound. At this time the labor of a good workman was worth sixteen dollars a day. Such goods, as happened to be scarce and in demand, would bring a fabulous price. Knee boots that cost me six dollars a pair I could have sold for one hundred dollars. Colt's revolvers, worth in New York fifteen to twenty dollars, sold for one twenty-five to one hundred and fifty dollars. I paid in San Francisco twenty-five dollars each for ordinary scythes, and sold them in Stockton for seventy-five dollars each. Beads, which cost thirty cents a bunch, I sold to Indians for ten dollars a bunch. Fresh eggs brought fifty cents each, a fowl being worth sixteen dollars. 
The country was overrun with rats brought in by the vessels, and as no cats had been imported, there was for a long time a boom in the feline market, and all the cats that could be collected from abroad were sold at a, on arrival for sixteen dollars each. The only currency was gold dust, which was carried in small buckskin bags, the gold being rated at sixteen dollars per ounce and weighed out by scales, which were found at every place of business. Life in California was at that time a wild romance. No words of mine can describe the scenes that were enacted during that chaotic period. Thousands of men, organized in bands or wholly disorganized, were constantly arriving from every part of the world and leaving for the diggings. Outlaws and professional gamblers opened saloons by the score at every point where men congregated. Money was scattered everywhere as if by the wind. Miners who had realized fortunes in a few days came down to Stockton, Sacramento, and San Francisco to squander them in a night at the gambling tables. With those who made San Francisco their temporary abode, gambling appeared to be the chief occupation and Spanish Monte the favorite game. In February 1851, I passed out of the Golden Gate, laden with the experience of a most romantic chapter of life, no worse off financially and perhaps a little better than when I left home two years before. At Panama, by placing confidence in the honesty of a native porter, I lost my trunk with all my clothing, my gold watch, and about six hundred dollars worth of gold. I spent three days in searching for it, by which delay I lost the company of all passengers who made the transit of the Isthmus in regular time for steamers about to leave Chagres. I'd calculated the time so that by rapid riding on horseback to Gorgana and special boat service down the river Chagres, I could just catch the last steamer advertised to leave for New York. I knew nothing of the great risk in traveling alone, as the natives two years before appeared to me an exceptionally honest people. But two years' contact with American roughs had changed them to thieves and murderers, and the whole route across the isthmus was infested with American, English, and Spanish highwaymen who pounced upon defenseless travelers at every opportunity. The result of my gold hunting was that my entire stock of effects consisted of the clothing I had on, namely corduroy trousers, a soiled shirt, and a brown-lined coat, together with a grizzly bear skin which I had saved as a trophy of California. When we reached New York I was completely cured of my passion for adventure and ready to put on the harness of hard and sober work for all the rest of my life. The Century Illustrated Magazine, Volume 41, April 1891, to California by Panama in 49 by Julius H. Pratt, illustrations by Gilbert Gall from drawings made by Charles Nall in 1850, page 903 to 17. The clothes Jesse brought for the trip to California were all wrong, and Jesse said that Panama was a nightmare and because she'd wanted to go with Fremont on his journeys, instead she'd turned Fremont's notes into the into the adventure she never had. But the trip to California was no fun at all, and the crew of her boat ran away, and she was stuck in Panama for seven weeks. When another boat to California finally showed up, the sleeping berths were marked off by chalk lines, and to make matters worse, Jessie'd been sick in Panama when she heard about the fourth expedition, and she'd been told that her husband would lose a leg to frostbite, but that would turn out to be a false story. Fremont wanted to buy the Rancho Las Pulgas in California, or the Ranch of the Fleas, where Oakland is today but the man he sent to buy land for him had taken Fremont's money and bought Las Mariposas, or the Butterflies, instead, a ranch up the mountains in Bear Valley. Las Mariposas was seventy square miles of land that was the size of Washington, D.C., and it had a fourteen-mile stretch along the Merced River, and the man Fremont had trusted with his money was probably swayed by a Spaniard saying, Oh, you don't want to buy the fleas. For the same money, you could buy the butterflies. It turned out that Fremont had the richest gold mine in California, and he called it the Princeton Mine, 
and at one time he had 16,000 people working at his gold mine, and Fremont hired many Hungarians who had escaped the turmoil in their home country. Fremont was paid hundreds of thousands of dollars by the U.S. government to give beef to the California Indians to deter them from raiding and pillaging, and Fremont also sold cattle to the gold miners. The Fremonts called their homestead the Little White House, and the man who wrote two years before the mast came to visit the Fremonts at Las Mariposas, and Jesse hired a German pastry cook. Fremont would spend a lot of time in court fighting over clear title to his land, because the Spaniards had been less than diligent about keeping records of property lines, and rich plantation owners would pay squatters to cause him trouble, and it would finally take the new President Pierce to grant Fremont clear title to Las Mariposas, Las Mariposas even though the U.S. Supreme Court had already found in his favor, and Fremont's lawyers ended up with most of his money. Fremont went to England to see some people who had signed promissories to him, and he got to meet Queen Victoria, and Fremont and Jesse went to dozens of parties where his diorama was shown, and the diorama was an oil painting that was 2,500 feet long, and it was wound onto a spool that took two hours to unwind. Fremont's diorama had already been shown to many audiences around the American West, and as soon as Fremont had landed in England, he was arrested and accused of being a swindler over some rented land in California. Fremont's English lawyer had a nervous breakdown, but Fremont was unfazed, and after sorting that out, Fremont went to France, and Prince Bonaparte agreed to help him sell land in California, and Jessie found two French girls willing to come to America to be her maids. Fremont became the governor of Arizona, and he moved the capital from Prescott to Tucson, and Jesse went back to live in New York while their daughter stayed in Arizona to help Fremont open a copper mine, but he couldn't find the money to start the project, and the man who mined it later would become one of the richest copper producers in the world. Fremont tried to raise money to cut a channel to the ocean from the Salton Sea, and the Barings Bank, where he kept his money in London, went out of business. And Fremont got a job as an Indian agent trying to get Texas land claims for the Cherokee. But he trusted other people to do the work, and they failed to help anyone. The Indians had been signing paper treaties in hopes that the settlers would become more friendly if they signed. And the Indians had no real idea what the treaties meant, so fighting Indians had become an everyday battle. Fremont was spending half his time in Washington trying to raise money for his irrigation projects, and then his daughter got typhoid fever and went back east to live with her mother, and Fremont was also trying to build a railroad from Tucson to the Gulf of California. The settlers wanted to banish the Indians to Baja because they were interfering with the building of the railroad, and all the stuff the Fremonts had in storage burned up in a fire. To find the best route to California, people had first followed the trails used by buffalo, then by Indians, then by fur traders, then by Mormons and the wagon trains, and then by the Pony Express, and a book called Seven Trails West had a help-wanted ad for the Pony Express that said, Young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over eighteen, must be expert riders willing to risk death daily, orphans preferred. Wages $25 per week. Apply Central Overland Express, Alta Building, Montgomery Street. The Pony Express began in 1860 and lasted only 19 months until the telegraph came through. In 1861, which was a blessing because of what the Pony Express did to horses. And the army had tried using camels, but the ground was too rocky for their soft feet. The Pony Express had 200 relay stations, and Buffalo Bill was one of the riders, and so was Wild Bill Hickok, and many station keepers were killed at their post by Indians. 
The Pony Express would ride from St. Louis to the West Coast in 23 days, and a movie about Wild Bill Hickok starring Jeff Bridges showed him going to an opium den several times and telling a female friend that he was starting to have bad dreams after smoking opium, so she suggested that he just stick to whiskey. When the Confederate South cut off some of the Pony Express routes during the war between the states, the Northern Passage helped keep California on the Union side. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the Pacific Railroad Act, and he called it the Union Railroad, in hopes of keeping the country together. And Congress had been able to pass a railroad bill until Congress had been unable to pass a railroad bill until after the South left the Union, after which there was no longer any dispute about where the chosen route would be. One month after Lincoln was sworn into office, the South quit the Union in April of 1861, and Britain had already recognized the South as belligerents on the 13th of March, and the disagreement over the Pacific Railroad Act had come from Southerners insisting that the Homestead Homestead Act pass into law along with the Railroad Act so that all land grants along the railroad route would be forced to admit slavery, and the Homestead Act would finally pass in 1862 after the war between the states began, giving 160 acres to anyone willing to settle out west, and the first claim to the free homestead land was claimed by a man named Freeman. The U.S. Navy went on alert up and down the Atlantic coast, the Atlantic coast, in August of 1861 to keep the British from interfering in American business, and Lincoln created two federal corporations in 1862 and 1864 to build railroads, with the Union Pacific heading west towards the west and the Central Railroad starting from California and working towards the center of America. The chosen route was along the Oregon Trail that went through Donner's Pass, and a southern route was added through New Mexico and Arizona that would have a final link-up in Needles, California, and it would take longer to build due to stock speculation and lack of air conditioning, which would not make the Sun Belt habitable until the 1920s. The railroads were given 20-square-mile land grants on either side of the tracks, with ownership alternating between the railroad companies and the government, and 20 million acres were given to the railroads while all sorts of chicanery, chicanery went on with railroad stock sales because stock sellers would claim that the railroad, railroad was coming through where it wasn't, where it often wasn't. As track was laid, Frequent oxbows appeared in order to garner more land, and the railroads were not just granted land upon which to build tracks, but were loaned enough money to buy rails and equipment and to pay their workers. The railroad headed straight west from St. Louis towards Kansas City, and then continued west towards the Rocky Mountains along the Arkansas River and the railroad companies wanted to build towns in Kansas so people would use their railroad. Outside the Homestead Act, the cost of a train ticket was taken off the price of any piece of land in Kansas, and the railroad also gave away free building material, and the people came by the train load to Kansas, and droughts and clouds of grasshoppers forced them to leave by the train load. Russian immigrants arrived to take over where others had failed, since their previous experience in Russia made Kansas seem a lot like heaven and the Russians brought hard red wheat with them that took well in the Kansas soil. The railroads even chartered ocean liners to bring people over from Europe so they could settle in Kansas, and they came from Sweden and Italy and Germany and Poland and Hungary, and train stations sprung up as soon as the trains started rolling, not just for the passengers, but to accommodate the crews who ran the railroads. The U.S. government relaxed immigration laws in 1864 to admit more foreign workers to build the railroads, and the railroads were given permission to deduct the cost of their transportation to America from their wages. Without the work done by Chinese on the railroads, it would have taken a decade longer, 
and China was called the Celestial Kingdom, and the Chinese were called the Celestials, while the other workers were called Terrestrials. The Chinese were paid the same wage as other Americans, but they refused to eat the company food and preferred to eat their own rice and vegetables rather than beans and bacon. And some thought the Chinese were being cheated because the railroad company was supplying the food for free, but the Chinese were suffering less disease because they boiled their water for tea. The steam engine itself needed 1,000 gallons of water to go 15 miles, and work on the railroad was accomplished by running rail cars back and forth with bunk beds, sleeping quarters, and feeding stations, and the Union Pacific paid Buffalo Bill Cody to kill enough buffalo to feed the railroad workers, giving him $500 per month for 12 buffalo per day to feed 1,200 workers. Every man put his heart and soul into building the railroad, because it was intended to benefit even the most common Americas, Americans, and all would be welcome aboard. After building the railroad through Kansas in the winter, the engineers would rather build a railroad to hell than to Seattle, so the railroad went to Sacramento instead of up to the Pacific Northwest. A link was made to Chicago that was north of St. Louis, and Milwaukee was north of Chicago, and Seattle was north of Milwaukee, and even north of Fargo, North Dakota, which was just north of Bismarck. And not only did they have to fight the cold, they also had to fight the Indians, who remained more numerous in the Pacific Northwest, and the fiercest of them all were the Blackfoot of Idaho. The Salmon River here, often called the River of No Return, is a physical phenomenon in itself. It is the headlong and furious stream that Clark entered in 1805 only to turn back after he had followed it fifty miles, and it is the river that a few others since that day have ventured to navigate, some to emerge with their hair standing on end and others never to emerge at all. And the country around it is no less magnificent than the river itself. Its mountainous breadth, its breadth is the home of hundreds of peaks, many of them unnamed, of more lovely lakes than have been named and explored, and of millions of feet of timber in which there has never been the sound of an axe. This is in many parts an undiscovered forested wilderness and presents, when seen from the air or from its own altitudes, some quite overwhelming contrasts. It has many a broad sweep of ragged peaks and high, almost inaccessible pockets where mountain sheep live, but adjacent to any of these more formidable reaches and in almost any direction there are lakes of utmost loveliness and serenity or impassable jungles of fir and lodgepole and pine, or meadows where wild flowers grow dense and knee-deep, or river gorges dropping sharp and sudden to the white-capped waters below. There are innumerable smaller streams hidden by shadow and jungle growth where the fish have never seen an angler. There, the frontier still lives almost isolated from the world, and mountaineers are still a law unto themselves. Idaho, A Guide in Word and Pictures, WPA Federal Writers Project, 1937, page 46 and 7. The Indians tried to sabotage the railroads, but the war between the states had taught many Americans how to shoot and kill, so the Indians didn't have much of a chance anymore. General Grant would help protect the railroads for many years following the war and the Union Pacific Railroad to San Francisco was completed in May of 1869, and the highest point on the Union Pacific route was named after the Union General who had burned Atlanta, and they had bypassed Salt Lake City. Now people could ride the train from the east to the west coast in two weeks instead of the journey taking six months, and so the west was won. The Union Pacific owned 12 million acres of land in 1872, and cowboys made cattle drives in order to meet the train where the cows were loaded onto cattle cars to be shipped to Chicago for slaughter, as described in The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Jorgis, too, had heard of America. <clears throat> That was a country where they said a man might earn three rubles a day, and Jurgis figured what three rubles a day would mean. 
In that country, rich or poor, a man was free, it was said. He did not have to go into the army. He did not have to pay out his money to rascally officials. He might do as he pleased and count himself as good as any other man. So America was a place of which lovers and young people dreamed. If one could only manage to get the price of a passage, he could count his troubles at an end. It was arranged that they should leave the following spring, and so to Chicago the party was bound. They knew that one word, Chicago, and that was all they needed to know, at least until they reached the city. They sat and stared out of the window. They were on a street which seemed to run on forever, mile after mile. A full hour before the party reached the city, they had begun to note the perplexing changes in the atmosphere. It grew darker all the time, and upon the earth the grass seemed to grow less green. Every minute, as the train sped on, the color of things became dingier. It was now no longer something far off and faint that you caught in whiffs. You could literally taste it as well as smell it. You could take hold of it almost and examine it at your leisure. They were divided in their opinions about it. It was an elemental odor, raw and crude. It was rich, almost rancid, sensual and strong. There were some who drank it in as if it were an intoxicant. There were others who put their handkerchiefs to their faces. The new immigrants were still tasting it, lost in wonder, when suddenly the car came to a halt, and the door was flung open, and a voice shouted, Stockyards! They stood there while the sun went down upon this scene, and the sky in the west turned blood red, and the tops of the houses shone like fire. To the two who stood watching while the darkness swallowed it up, it seemed a dream of wonder, with its tale of human energy, of things being done, of employment and freedom, of life and love and joy. When they came away arm in arm, Jurgis was saying, "'Tomorrow I shall go there and get a job.'" The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, New York, a signet classic, the New American Library of World Literature, Inc., 1905-1962, page 30 and 34. <clears throat> By 1872, the Santa Fe Railroad reached the Colorado border, and railroad workers in Colorado fought with cowboys over fences, and farmers in Kansas fought with cowboys over fences, and in Montana, cattlemen fought with sheep farmers over available grass on the wide open range. General Palmer wanted the Santa Fe Railroad to go to Mexico City from Colorado Springs, Colorado, but the Santa Fe Railroad fought him about that, even hiring some gunslingers to back them up. So Palmer gathered his own armed men together and then paid off the hired gunslingers to stand down. The Santa Fe dispatchers refused Palmer's bribe, so Palmer's people surrounded their office and initiated a shootout, and two Santa Fe men were killed and two were wounded. Thereafter, Palmer was allowed to build his own railroads in Colorado, but the Santa Fe would only pass through on its way to California without stopping, so Colorado Springs failed to grow as much as other towns, alongside the bad rumors the Santa Fe people were spreading about the town. Colorado would become the 38th state admitted to the Union in 1876, and the Santa Fe Railroad stopped at Pueblo, 40 miles south of Colorado Springs, near what is now Fremont County. The Santa Fe Railroad symbol was popular with Southern Indians because it looked like their picture word for the sun god, and legend had it that the Santa Fe symbol was first drawn on a poker chip, but the more popular theory was that it was first made from a circle traced around a silver dollar. Indians had tried to derail the trains in the West, but somehow the Americans magically knew when the rails had been damaged, and squads of army men and repair crews would appear to repair the tracks and hunt down the miscreants. And in 1876, all the Indians who could ride rode to Montana to kill 600 soldiers led by General George Custer and the last day on the battlefield was right down the road from Bismarck, North Dakota. The events of June 25, 1876, have produced many questions and fueled many controversies, some of them unanswerable. One of the most persistent 
is, did Custer and his soldiers drink whiskey before the battle? I think there is little doubt that some officers and troopers with Custer did some drinking. Further testimony is found in a recently published account of the campaign by Private William O. Taylor of A Troop, with Custer on the Little Bighorn. In recalling Reno's charge, Taylor wrote, The Major and Lieutenant Hodgson were riding side by side a short distance in the rear of my company. As I looked back, Major Reno was just taking a bottle from his lips. He then passed it to Lieutenant Hodgson. It appeared to be a quart flask, and about half or two-thirds full of an amber-colored liquid. Little Bighorn remembered. The untold Indian story of Custer's Last Stand by Herman J. Viola, New York Times Books, Random House, Inc., 1999, page 111 and 12. The late Robert Yellowtail, once a son-in-law of White Man Runs Him, knew the old scout quite well and told me that White Man Runs Him swore up and down that the soldiers had firewater that day, contrary to the writers who claimed that Custer never drank. White Man Runs Him said that when they were coming down dense Ashwood Creek, now called Reno Creek, they stopped to water their horses. Everyone then got some crackers and cold bacon. While they were resting, a pack train of six or eight mules came along. Each mule carried a keg on each side. These kegs were quickly unplugged, and soldiers lined up with their tin cups to receive their share. The scouts were told to go and get some for themselves. White Man Runs Him said, I took my canteen and almost filled it up. It tasted terrible. It was the first time I'd ever tasted fire water. They said, drink it up, so I finally drank most of it. Before I got to the bottom, I was all warm, and my lips and fingertips felt numb. I felt like singing. All the scouts drank. The soldiers were drinking all of them. Pretty soon they started whooping it up and getting drunk. White Man Runs Him said that the scouts then asked Mitch Booyer, How come they're drinking, going crazy at a time like this? Oh, Booyer laughed, Custer wants to make them brave. He sure didn't make them brave, White Man Runs Him said. It made them crazy. Little Bighorn remembered, page 113. Mr. Viola said that there were written eyewitness accounts that whiskey flacks were found on many of the dead soldiers, including Custer himself. As far as the Crow scouts were concerned, the evidence was overwhelming that the troopers with Custer had whiskey that day. The failure of white interviewers to accept the word of the scouts in this matter made them increasingly reluctant to talk about the battle as they grew older. Several times I saw a white man runs him become irritated or disgusted with interviewers when he recounted the drinking incident. On one occasion, when I acted as his interpreter, he told me, Tell this man I don't like him. He asks leading questions. I am tired. I am insulted. When I tell the truth, he won't listen. Little Bighorn remembered. Page 114. About fifty years ago, I also obtained independent verification of whiskey in the army camp from a half-blood Crow Indian named Richard Pickett. His father, Joe Pickett, had been a trader in 1875 at Fort Benton in northern Montana. Joe Pickett was ordered to take several wagon loads of whiskey kegs to the army camp. He loaded two eight-mule wagons with nothing but whiskey. Pickett reported that from Fort Benton he traveled all the way to the soldiers' base camp at the confluence of the Tongue and Yellowstone Rivers. Little Bighorn remembered, page 113. Historically, when Custer had attended West Point in 1857, he had, quote, spent considerable time in extracurricular extracurricular activities, including, according to historian Robert M. Utley in Cavalier and Buckskin, many an all-night excursion to Benny Havens, the already legendary off-post drinking establishment, close quote. Little Bighorn remembered, page 186. Apparently, Custer's last command had been, bring up the whiskey barrels, while the major error had been to substitute an additional two barrels on one mule, rather than a second Gatling gun. The wagon trains had been such easy prey that many Indians had quit hunting, and when the wagon trains stopped coming because settlers were now moving west by railroad, 
The Indians went back to hunting buffalo, but by this time the buffalo were gone. Killing buffalo had been encouraged because trains were unable to plow through the thick herds, and buffalo stampedes could turn an entire town to dust. So the buffalo had been shot from train windows for sport and for purpose, and the buffalo died like flies. Even before the buffalo were gone, Indians had been attracted to the American forts where they had become hopeless drunks and shameless beggars. And the Indians failed to notice how quickly the buffalo were disappearing as they clustered around the forts, begging mostly for alcohol. And Americans thought that many more buffalo existed because the Indians had not yet been complaining. The Santa Fe and the Union Pacific finally met at Needles, California, in 1883. And so the railroad won the West, and the cowboy age would come to a screeching halt in 1887, when an enormous blizzard covered the West for three days, killing millions of cattle and bankrupting the big cattle companies. There had been twelve million buffalo on the prairie before the railroad came through, and hitting a herd of them could derail a train. So buffalo were considered vermin, while the domesticated cattle were brought in to replace them. But the blizzard of the 1887 made people think again about keeping the buffalo around. In 1888, only a few hundred buffalo were left alive, and they would become nearly extinct before Congress stepped in to protect them. When it had come time to drive the last spike home, the Western Railroad president was so drunk he missed the spike and hit the tie and the Eastern Railroad president was too hungover to even hit the tie, so they let a common worker drive the last spike home. The Transcontinental Railroad had been made possible by the invention of dynamite in 1866, and Alfred Noble's youngest brother had been killed in 1864 in an explosion while experimenting with nitroglycerin in the family's factory in Sweden. So Alfred had set his heart on making dynamite safer. Alfred Noble, Nobel used fossilized algae from the Elba River to create his dynamite, and he sold the rights to the DuPont Company that was founded by Mr. DuPont, who had fled the terror in, in France. DuPont had come to America and built a factory in Delaware to make gunpowder, and DuPont had supplied half the gunpowder used by the Union Army in the war between the states, and the railroad would use DuPont's dynamite to blast its way across America to bring the East and the West Coasts together. The railroad engineers drilled down twelve feet deep into solid granite, stuffing dynamite into the holes to carve their way through mountains all across the West, and the railroad built snow plows that needed thirteen engine cars to push the snow off the tracks, and the last ten miles of railway joining the eastern and the western lines of the United of the Union Pacific Railroad was laid by a team of Chinese and Irishmen working together, chosen for that honor because they were the very best Gandhi dancers. In the end, the Union Pacific Railroad had lost as many workers to drunken gunfights as they had lost to industrial accidents. I whacked an eight-mule team to Zion, as the Mormons called Salt Lake City or Utah at that time. On my arrival in Brigham's country, and after unloading the mule wagons and drawing my pay, the latter being very important, I took a look at the tabernacle and the city in general, and was surprised to see what Brigham and the Twelve Apostles had done with the desert. While wandering around looking at the stores and reading the strange signs over the doors, my attention was called to one reading, Zion's Cooperative Mercantile Institution, Holiness to the Lord. My curiosity was aroused, and wishing to know how they dished out holiness, I stepped inside, and in looking around the store I found from all appearance, holiness was mostly kept in bottles. A Mormon-looking chap told me that the bottles contained valley tan, and on my asking what it cost to sample the tan, he said, one drink for fifty cents or three for a dollar. For a starter, I invested fifty cents, and after it got to working on me, I felt that I could whip all the Sioux Indians on the plains, or any of the bullwhackers who had been in the habit of talking back to me. 
I want to tell you that valley tan was the forty rod stuff. In order to be sociable, I invited an elder looking chap to have a drink with me, and he told me that the stuff was made from wheat and potatoes, and I said I thought it was made of horn toads and Rocky Mountain rattlesnakes, judging from the way it agitated me. I tell you that it put a fellow in the brave column all right. Of course I felt like fighting something or somebody, and after I had zipped out two or three warlike whoops, a fellow tapped me on the shoulder and whispered in my ear that I was not posted on their ways of silent dreams and blood atonement, nor was I of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He said the sign of the pick and spade meant there they were the proper implements for digging a grave, and advised me to be a little less hilarious. His hint made a profound impression on me, and the jubilant effects of the valley tan having begun to subside, I concluded that as soon as I had seen Brother Brigham, a few of the twelve, and perhaps one or two of the saintesses, I would pull out for Southern California or Nevada. In a short time I ran across a man named Kincaid, who had a fine mule team and was minus a mule skinner, so I tied to him for a trip to San Bernardino, California. Some pioneer recollections being the autobiography of George Lathrop, one of the first to help in the opening of the West, and a statement made by John Sinclair relative to the rescue of the Donner Party, Philadelphia, George W. Jacobs and Company, 1927, page 14 and 15. With a transcontinental railroad, the soldiers after the war between the states had somewhere to go instead of staying home, and the Wild West was being flooded with people leaving the aftermath of the battle back east. Before 1860, the American South had only one-third of the railroads as the North, and General Sherman knew that no horse-drawn wagons could go more than 100 miles before the contents of the wagons were consumed by the Teamsters and the animals pulling them. After the American War of Independence, England had put a tariff on American goods that made the South suffer, and ships would more often sail to and from England than between the American North and the American South, and the lack of connecting railroads had kept the North and the South divided. During the American War of Independence, 40% of, po of the population of the South had come from Africa and slave traders had taken rum to Africa, where Africans would sell their best friends for a bottle. And New York and Pennsylvania weren't as dependent on the run, rum trade, because the North had apple trees and could make applejack, while the South remained rum drinkers. Jamestown in 1607 had been the first European settlement in America and two-thirds of them had died from not being able to do the necessary work for survival until Captain Smith started pointing his pistol at them to make them more industrious. By 1609, some of the people in Jamestown preferred stealing from the Indians who couldn't figure out why Europeans were so cruel, and Jamestown would have used the Indians as slaves, but they kept dying of European diseases. The people in Jamestown received their first African slaves in 1619, supposedly as indentured servants, but the, and these were sent to work in the tobacco fields. The Africans were delighted to be away from Africa and made the mistake of doing too good a job, and so the Jamestown landowners decided to keep them after their seven years of indentured servitude were up. People from Holland and Poland and France and Russia and Armenia came over to join Jamestown, and the settlers fought it out with the Indians in 1622, and most of the Europeans were killed. But the Indians didn't kill any of the Africans, and the Europeans hated the Africans for this and began to treat them as the enemy. The Europeans declared war on the Indians, and before anyone knew it, only a few Algonquins were left alive, and in 1660, slavery became the law in Virginia. The spinning jenny and the steam engine were invented in England in 1764, 
and for the next one hundred years Britain was ahead of everyone else, and the British bought the South's cotton to run through its mills, and they exported the finished fabric to the entire world in their many ships that had begun flying the Union Jack in 1801, boasting the cross of St. George superimposed on Ireland's cross of St. Patrick switched up with Scotland's cross of St. Andrew. In order to grow enough cotton to keep up with the cost of importing slaves, southern plantations had to be utterly enormous, and living in isolated splendor with their unpaid servants, the southern lifestyle tended towards assumptions of superior rank and breeding, so plantation owners identified more with European nobility than with their more common and pedestrian northern neighbors. Since most of the people who'd settled in Georgia were the wretchedly poor outcasts of England, their hatred of poverty had grown into thinking that it was nobler to own slaves than to be poor. With no incentive to labor, slaves worked as little as possible, so Southerners thought Africans were lazy. Although the slaves' own gardens thrived, kept carefully under the radar, lest the masters become suspicious. Living so far away from their neighbors, Southerners on their huge estates were confined mostly to the company of their Africans, and the arrival of any visitors would explode into a massive party. Behind their dedication to Southern hus hospitality, the plantation owners kept a large number of mixed-race offspring. Plantation owners practiced the persistent tradition of battling for honor which they considered not only to be the height of virtue, but the only proper and legitimate way of life. And with Africans doing all their work, the southern plantation owners had more than enough time to come up to Washington, D.C. To, to, to stir up trouble with the government. Because slavery allowed plantation owners the luxury of running for public office, the presidency was almost continuously in southern hands from 1789 to 1837. Slavery had been outlawed in Vermont in 1777, and when the slaves revolted in Haiti in 1791, it had been seen primarily as a French problem because the French had tried to turn their Africans into French citizens, and the Haitian had taken the revolutionary, revolutionary ideas of France to heart. The British would have helped quell the revolt in Haiti, but they were too busy worrying about Napoleon. And when the French withdrew from Haiti, the spirit of revolution spread to infect all enslaved Africans and caused 150 revolts on slave ships. By 1801, there were 5 million people in America and 1 million of them had come from Africa. And all free, Afri all free Americans of African descent had to leave Virginia after 1806, and importing slaves became, became illegal in Virginia in 1807, but it continued anyway. While slaves were being bought and sold, the Navy was in the practice of flogging their sailors, and it amused the Indians that Lewis and Clark would flog members of their own company. Nat Turner started a slave revolt in August of 1831 by killing his master and marching across the country, making friends and killing people, and both sides lost 100 people until Nat Turner's revolt ended in October when Nat Turner suffered death by hanging. Hundreds of slave revolts followed, but plantations were too far away from each other for any serious rebellion to spread and slavery would have ended when the plantations went out of business, but Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin in 1793 kept the South in business, and until the cotton gin, very few people could afford to buy clothes made out of cotton, and instead they wore flax or hemp, but now they could wear cotton. Whitney also invented the first mass-produced gun, rather than their having to be made by hand, one at a time. Britain had extensive experience with foreign lands and slavery, so it had not been difficult for the British to, sl to side with the slave owners. There was usually a fight about this time of the evening, 
Everybody in camp was more or less bored, with nothing to do but work and drink and sweat. There was not much real excitement on the diamond fields, in spite of the possibilities of huge fortunes being made at any moment. Men forged their own excitement from muscles, alcohol, temper, and lust, because uninterrupted greed and work and hope are soon a wearisome monotony. Diamond Fever by Richard W. Kreps, original title Baboon Rock, Dell Publishing Company, Inc., The Macmillan Company, 1959, page 94. The seat of the throne grunted wheezily, for it was human. On a dais of boulders overspread with hides and pelts, a plump slave lay at full length. Bavia An sat on the small of his back. Another slave, a short, big-bellied bushman, stood behind to prop the, to prop the imperial torso. Torso, two or two more knelt at either side, supporting his arms. It was not an especially comfortable throne, but it was decidedly regal. "'If we cannot come back,' said the white man, shrugging his shoulders, "'you will lose many fine things which I will bring you to trade for the stone. Beads, kegs of brandy, ostrich feathers, bolts of beautiful cloth, two mules to carry them, which would also be yours, bottles of gin from over the sea.' "'I do not believe in the sea,' said Bavia An. "'It is a lie. There is only Africa, in which I am the greatest monarch, and wide rivers running alongside the land. I would truly enjoy trading you the stone for something. I will think. Would you care for some beer?' Diamond Fever, page 7 and 8. There was no vegetation, the thorn bushes, the gnarled trees, and miserable scrub that once had grown here were long gone for firewood. There was no sanitation and no water. There was no church or hospital or school. But there were scores of canvas bar rooms, a dozen gambling shanties, and a couple of pavilions where boxing matches and cockfights were held. Two years ago, in seventy, this had been part of Vurishzit, the De Beers farm, and a mighty poor farm it must have been. Now it was called New Rush. Diamond Fever, page 26 and 7. The camp was terribly vulnerable to fire. No water, acres of canvas and dry wood, everything crowded together. Thank God there was no wind tonight. Across the camp, near the edge of the diamond field, there was a vivid orange glow. As they ran toward it, little feathers of red flame began to ruffle up into the black sky. Another tent had caught a small one a dozen yards off. A piece of burning canvas had been thrown on to it by the draft of the big fire. Two or three bottles of wine exploded. The fire licked out with multiple tongues from the melting sheet of canvas. A great torrid parching heat swelled over the two men, reeking of hell. With a particular peculiarly horrifying sound, a long ripping and then an immense whoosh, like the sigh of a stricken giant, the canvas above them tore loose and fell. A fuselage behind them, more bottles detonating, he guessed, was followed by a pair of muffled crashes as two kegs of brandy burst open, then a cask of whiskey split its staves, and runnels of blue and red fire came spurting at them under the bar. There was something terrifying about those thin streams of kindled liquor. They looked as though they were malevolent, as though they had brains to hate and to search, like so many burning snakes. He ripped off half a sleeve, sleeve, opened the bung of a cask and soaked it with whiskey, and began to wash his hands and face with it. It had been a fine blaze, with plenty of excitement and fierce fun. Diamond Fever, page 113 to 124. To emphasize the unpleasant foreign nature of slavery, Uncle Tom's Cabin was written in 1852 by someone who thought the African slaves should be returned to Africa, and Uncle Tom's Cabin had first been published in a magazine with the title Life Among the Lowly, and then the novel was made into a play that toured across the country. Uncle Tom's Cabin described African slaves as being unable to speak the American language or simply struggling along using some childlike rendition, and Southerners believed that giving freedom to Africans would harm them because the Africans were not mentally capable of meeting the responsibilities required of a free people. 
Plantation owners considered it their duty to beat some of their slaves and to shoot others in order to keep them safely in line for their own good, and Southerners who treated slaves with violence were prone to treat political opponents the same way. Dueling had been the Southerners' argument of choice, so it would be just one small step farther to challenge the North to war. The political fight had intensified over fugitive slave laws, and in exchange for California becoming a free state in 1850, Southerners had been allowed to press their fugitive slave laws, but they had done so to the extreme. If anyone failed to help arrest a fugitive slave, they were subject to arrest themselves, and so the North was being made to suffer from the institution of slavery in the South. Fugitive slave laws were helped by the fact that it was impossible for the Africans to blend in, and in 1856 a senator from the South broke his gutta percha cane over the head of a senator from the North on the floor of Congress. Senate brawling on the whole has been less frequent than the House variety and more rigorously condemned after the fact. In 1850, while Senator Henry Foote of Mississippi was speaking on the floor, Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri made menacing gestures and advanced towards Foote's desk. Foote drew his pistol and ostentatiously cocked it, but cooler heads intervened. An investigating committee recommended censure of both men, but the Senate took no action. Both your houses, The Truth About Congress by Warren Weaver, Jr., New York Prager Publishers, 1972, page 48. The war wasn't so much about the price of cotton or the amount of wages being paid in northern factories, and it wasn't even about the independent treasury keeping America's money away from private banks. The issue was actually about land, and Abraham Lincoln wanted America to be big enough to be able to stand on its own feet and say no to Europe. Without the South, America was in danger of falling prey to Britain's desire to reclaim its old colony of New England, and the Southerners thought that becoming a colony again was not such a bad idea. Many Southern plantation owners were of noble descent, having fled from Napoleon's experiment in democracy, and their offspring thought the notion of being ruled by princes was rather romantic. While the Northern immigrants Immigrants who had come from England and Germany and Italy were willing to shoot anyone inviting royals over to take a land survey. In England, the working classes sided with the North and the nobility with the South. And Lincoln had been a land surveyor and knew how many farms fit within a mile and how many miles it took to build a sustainable tax base. Lincoln knew that when a country managed to acquire a big enough piece of land, it no longer need be afraid of its neighbors, and his example was Russia, who had never lost a war because it was so overwhelmingly large. Lincoln knew enough to follow that example, and George Washington had also been a property surveyor, and George Washington had no children of his own to whom he could pass his land holdings, so Washington had become the father of the whole country. The South wanted more land, and the South needed more land because cotton required plenty of farmland, but since slaves had no vote, the North held the majority in electing Lincoln. The vice president in 1860 was a Southerner, and people wanted to believe that Johnson had Northern sympathies, but Johnson had been put on the ticket with Lincoln specifically to gain Southern votes, and Johnson would become president over Lincoln's dead body. Johnson had been making changes to Lincoln's policies to satisfy Southerners, and Johnson even owned a few dozen slaves himself, while Lincoln wanted to send all of them to Panama, and Booth's calling card had been left at Johnson's house the day before the killing of Abraham Lincoln. Johnson had been inviting, inviting people from the South over for afternoon juleps, and he had been openly agreeing with them that Americans of African descent had no business being given the vote, and since the days when there were no roads or running water in Washington, D.C., just a few marble buildings and a slave market, 
abolitionists had been agitating for slaves to be free to go to church on Sunday and have that as a day of rest, but they didn't want them to be free citizens, just free to become Christians. In 1850, the slave trade had been quit in Washington, D.C., but not slavery itself, and an uppity African was one who had the audacity to question God. Slave owners believed that God approved of slavery since Jesus wanted to set prisoners free, but not any slaves. And when Liberia had been created in Africa in 1821 as a country for freed slaves, it had been spearheaded by a church organization. The American Colonization Society was not interested in freeing slaves, but in deporting those who had been freed so they couldn't cause trouble for the institution of slavery, and the capital of, of Liberia was named Monrovia after the Monroe Doctrine, and Liberia had finally been recognized as its own country in 1862. Vice President Johnson had been too poor to go to school, and his wife had taught him to read and write. So Johnson didn't hate slavery so much as he despised the big plantation owners with an abiding and a profound dislike, because Johnson did not fit in with the educated people in Washington, and he knew that he was just being used to prop up Abraham Lincoln's ticket. Johnson liked to travel making speeches, and his main argument was that slaves were private property, and thus the government had no business interfering in the business of keeping slaves, and he enjoyed engaging in animated discussions with the crowds and would get into fistfights with hecklers.